Hello, welcome to Churches for Middle East Peace's broadcast about the discussion on whether or not it might be possible to have a fund, a people to people fund, like there was in Ireland, as it relates to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're honored to have with us three esteemed gentlemen in the field of peace building. Um, Joel Ronald, the Executive Director of the Alliance for Middle East Peace is here. Hello, Joel. Hi, May. Father Josh Thomas, the International Executive Director of Kids for Peace, uh, and also a member of the Alliance for Middle East Peace Board of Directors. Hey, Josh. Hello, everyone. And Reverend Dr. Gary Mason, Director of Rethinking Conflict, who would be coming to us from Northern Ireland, but just happens to be in the United States at this moment. Welcome, Gary. Hey, thank you. Nice to be here in this warm weather. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Enjoying that Florida sunshine. Being well, back in Ireland, so I'm quite happy to be here. <laughs> good, good. Um, I'd like to actually start with you, Gary. Before we have you begin, I want to introduce you to those who are watching. So Reverend Dr. Gary Mason, as I mentioned, he's the director of Rethinking Conflict. He's an academic who has a doctorate from the School of Psychology at the University of Ulster and was awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity from Florida Southern College for his role in peace building in Ireland. He's a Methodist clergy member and has extensive experience in the Irish peace process. Now he's working with Israelis and Palestinians as well. Um, and he's hosted several of them in Belfast to have a conversation about what can be learned from the peace building experience in Ireland. So Gary, would love to have you start and introduce us to what is all this about a people to people fund and how did that work in Ireland and what could that mean for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Okay, I, I often say, May, when introducing the Irish peace process, I often quote a friend of mine who said, we most certainly knew how to end the war, we just don't know how to build a peace. So I want to put it in context that even 20 years after the signing of the very famous Good Friday Agreement, we are still taking painful, protracted steps to peace. And undoubtedly, the International Fund for Ireland was one of those very strategic funds that allowed that to happen. I'm probably better personalizing my experience with the fund and giving a little bit more detail around that. From 92 to 99, literally on an interface or Berlin type wall in Belfast, I worked along with a Catholic Dominican sister who was one of the other tribe in our context to put together a shared space for what we really call difficult, uncomfortable conversations during our conflict. The idea was to create space where people could be very detailed, very honest about the things that were dividing them. It really helped us from 92 to 99 to do that. I think it's also important to say that people like President Bill Clinton and others made a very strategic input into the Irish peace process and in fact took a, a young girl from my church, age, eight years of age, uh, a young boy, sorry, and a young Catholic girl, and brought them out to the United States to the Oval Office, really modeling that we needed to deal with this conflict to give these kids a future. From 99 through to about three years ago when I set up Rethinking Conflict, uh, the International Fund for Ireland helped me put together a project called Skenos, which is a Greek word for tent. Basically, the symbolism was inclusivity. Every person is welcome onto the tent. And they provided $5 million towards that. One of the key things for me about the International Fund for Ireland is they take what I call thoughtful strategic risks for peace. So while sometimes governments can be a little bit more cautious about putting money into concepts, the fund were willing to front load the Skenos project. They acted as a kind of interlocutor, as an influencer with other funds to get us over the line to put the Skenos fund. That was really crucial because not unlike the Middle East, we needed to break up what I call the very hardened soil of sectarianism to allow people at grassroots to actually believe is peace possible. I often remind folk in the early 1990s, there were three conflicts bubbling about in the world scene, not the only three, but we had South Africa, Israeli-Palestinian, and the Irish conflict. The irony of it is most commentators at that stage were saying the Palestinians and the Israelis would be over the line before the Irish. They were wrong. Uh, even Winston Churchill, 
Uh, the British Bulldog, uh, Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, said the Irish conflict was intractable. However, we've taken some very significant steps towards peace and undoubtedly the front played a very, very strategic role in allowing that to happen. Hopefully that gives your listeners just a little bit of insight into my relationship uh, with the fund. Thank you, Gary. And I think it's so important too. We talk all the time at Churches for Middle East Peace, and you mentioned peace is possible. And so often for those of us who are working in the space day to day, and certainly for those who are living in the region, sometimes it seems like peace is so far in the distant future. So it's an encouragement to be reminded and to look at historic and present day examples of where significant progress has been made in these communities where there's been historic conflict. So thank you for that encouragement. Hey, you're welcome. We'll move now to Joel, Joel Brunold, the Executive Director of the Alliance for Middle East Peace. Um, Joel uh, leads AllMap, and AllMap is a coalition of mo more than 100 people-to-people -people groups working to champion peace, um, Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians, um, and they're working really to create this fund, the national fund a people-to-people -people, um, fund for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And so, Joel, it'd be really helpful to hear from you um, where this idea came from, why you think mm -hmm. this might be a constructive um, effort towards peace. And particularly, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about um, sometimes people-to-people -people work is pretty criticized in our space. Um, it's viewed as being compromising or not addressing issues of security or issues of justice. And so, um, it'd be really helpful for you to talk a bit about the fund and people-to-people -people work more broadly um, in light of some of those potential challenges or criticisms. Sure, uh, I'll try and do my best with, uh, without going too over time. So um, thank you, May. Uh, so the, the challenge that we see is fundamentally um, this. The average age in Israel is 31. The average age in the West Bank is 20, and the average age in Gaza is 16. Um, if you uh, track people's lives against the conflict, you're, an Israeli was around 13 when Oslo was signed, they were 15 when Rabin was assassinated, uh, and they were 17 at the kickoff of the Second Intifada. Your average Palestinian living in the West Bank was not alive when Oslo was signed, and uh, for the children living in Gaza who make up the majority of the population, They've only experienced two wars. Given the political realities, therefore, it should come as no surprise that Israel and Palestine are the two countries in the world where, as you get younger, you actually become more skeptical and less optimistic. Everywhere that the Pew studies examine the youth, they show optimism. They show that they believe in a better future. They normally vote more liberal. In the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the younger you get, the more right-wing and religious you are. And so, when we ask ourselves, is peace possible? Will peace come from the ground up? Are there constituencies today for peace? The answer fundamentally is no. And that's not, uh, that's, that's not depressing, that's just a realistic assessment of the current challenge that we find. So the, the question for all of us is, how do we move from vicious cycles to virtuous circles? How do we try and deal with the fact that despite the, the realities of the asymmetry of power between Israelis and Palestinians, and that, of course, Israel is the more powerful party, there is a symmetry in fear and mistrust, that over 75% of both populations believe that the other is out to kill them, and that they are deeply fearful on a daily basis that they themselves will be hurt. Because as long as that's the reality, there is no pressure on the leadership to compromise. People won't vote for change, and they won't support their leadership if they do try to move for a compromise. So when we look at it, and the role of ORMAP has traditionally been to try and examine how these groups are financed. Uh, we do a lot of work on Capitol Hill. We've actually, uh, through our lobbying, achieved over $100 million for people-to-people -people efforts over the past 10 years. We've worked in Canada and the UK and a few other places. But when we look at the international community, there's a strategy when it comes to humanitarian assistance through the ad hoc liaison committee that the Norwegians run. There's a strategy when it comes to economic development through the office of the quartet representative. There is a strategy when we look at negotiations, whether that's through the quartet or the US, or there's someone thinking and waking up every day about how do we do this stuff. When it comes to civics, when it comes to the populations, 
There is no one who wakes up to ask themselves the question, how do we make sure the next generation does not hate each other? Collectively, as an international community, we spend over $13 billion a year on this conflict when you add in security assistance. Of that, only $45 million is spent on peace and reconciliation. So for the level of investment that we're making to try and resolve this conflict, if that's your premium principle, I mean, the premium to try and defend that is tiny in comparison. Gary mentioned the International Fund for Ireland. The fascinating thing about this fund is that it started in 1986. That was, um, to, so that was 12 years before the Good Friday Agreement. It was eight years before a ceasefire in 94. Um, sorry, six years before a ceasefire in 94. And it was at a time that no one thought peace was possible. But coming off the back of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, President Reagan and Speaker Tip O'Neill took the brave step of establishing the fund. And it brought congressional money that Catholics trusted and Commonwealth money that Protestants trusted and collaboratively created a fund managed by the Irish and British governments so that it would have legitimacy when, within both communities. And so what we're trying to do is, is replicate that and to create the, the bandwidth and budget and the question about how giving someone the responsibility in the international community of asking themselves, how do they make sure the next generation doesn't hate one another? And we're looking to try and create a $200 million a year fund funded by Congress, funded by the EU member states, funded by the rest of the international community and the private sector. And we've made progress on each of these levels. We have bipartisan legislation in the House. We're working for a Senate bill at the moment. We've uh, received endorsements from the Christian and Jewish community, from the Islamic community, from various world leaders. Uh, we've worked in the UK and Ireland. We've worked in Canada. We've just got off the phone to Australia with some Arab states as well. And we can see that especially given the depression on the concept of track one working right now, and that people do not believe that this set of leaders can deliver peace. Now is the time to try and understand what can we do to try and ensure that the next generation has a chance. And so I'm happy in Q&A or in the back and forth between Josh, Gary, myself and Yume to go into a little more about what this stuff could fund. But I'll finish off my remarks with something that we hold as a, as a key part of our work. When we talk about people to people, we talk about it as an and, not an or. People to people work is not an alternative. It's not an alternative to negotiations. It's not an alternative to pressure. It's not an alternative to human rights work. People to people work fundamentally is, um, people to people work is fundamentally an essential addition. It's something that has to be added on to something else that you do if you want to make sure that you're doing the necessary work on the grassroots. And that's how we see our work, not as a replacement of anything else, but as an essential addition. Thanks so much. Sorry, I think I was on mute. Thank you. Um, I have several questions for both you and Gary, which I will hold for just a few minutes. A quick one um, for those who are watching, you mentioned track one. For people who are not familiar with you know, diplomatic process or the difference between track one and track two, could you just briefly explain that? Sure. Um, track one is seen on the political negotiators level. So the country, sort of Jared Kushner, Jason Greenblatt, Prime Minister Netanyahu, President Abbas, that's track one. These are the people making the decisions. Track two is considered sort of um, professional lay, lay leadership. So um, businesses, professors, academia, other non people who don't have the authority but try and come up with innovative ideas. And track three is considered grassroots and sort of people to people work. Fabulous. Thank you. That's very helpful. Well, speaking of people to people work, um, we'll now turn to Father Josh Thomas, who's an Episcopal priest, executive director of Kids for Peace. Um, we have great, great respect for the work that Kids for Peace does and, and for all of you. Um, and so Josh would love to have you uh, talk a little bit about this interfaith youth movement that's centered in Jerusalem and the work that you're doing with Israeli and Palestinian and American youth. And how does the work that you're doing in this track three space of people to people, um, how does that uh, relate to the potential of this um, you know, Israeli-Palestinian people to people fund? Great. Thanks, May. It's great to be with you all today and to put a little bit of 
flesh on the bones to what Joel was talking about in terms of teaching the next generation uh, not to hate one another and to build a constituency for peace. Uh, Kids for Peace is one of the hundred member organizations of the Alliance for Middle East Peace, and it actually has uh, a deep link to the uh, Anglican Church. Kids for Peace was started 15 years ago in the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem uh, by Suhail Dawani, the current Archbishop, uh, who believed that children were the key to the next generation, uh, and that in the midst of a very difficult time, it was the Second Palestinian Intifada, uh, he wanted the children of the three religions of Jerusalem to have the chance to meet one another, uh, to discover their common humanity, to discover their common belief in one God, to discover their common belief in the image of God in each person and the sanctity of human life, uh, and to prioritize the church's mission for reconciliation uh, and the role, the vocation of bringing people together. Uh, Kids for Peace started in a very humble way with just 12 children, uh, four Christians, four Muslims, four Jews, uh, including uh, Bishop Dewani's own daughter, uh, who came to a summer camp and spent two weeks together learning about each other's religions and cultures, uh, breaking down stereotypes, fears, and misunderstandings, and uh, giving a sense of hope and possibility that there might actually be a partner for peace on the other side. Uh, life in Jerusalem, for those of you who have been, you know it's a divided city uh, where although people see one another on a regular basis, they don't normally interact and speak with one another. Uh, and for many people, Kids for Peace is the very first time that they have a chance to really sit and talk with a person that they have been taught for their whole life was their enemy, uh, someone they should not trust, someone that is out uh, to do them uh, ill. Uh, and in Kids for Peace, we're beginning to connect people from both sides of Jerusalem, uh, from all three religions, Israelis and Palestinians, to discover the partner on the side, uh, to understand each other's real lives, uh, both their individual life, but also the national aspirations of both sides, uh, and to start learning skills uh, for activism to be able to move their communities towards peace. Today in Jerusalem, Kids for Peace is one of the largest organizations working in this space. Uh, we have 500 families actively involved in the program from all parts of East and West Jerusalem. Uh, this is not just preaching to the choir. Uh, right from the beginning of Kids for Peace, uh, it was a value of ours to make sure we gathered the most diverse possible community of people uh, to reach all the critical sectors of society. Um, and rich and poor, left-wing, right-wing, religious, secular, all find a, a home in Kids for Peace uh, as a place, a platform where they actually meet the other, and not only learn from the other, but a place to share their own point of view and to be respected and understood and heard. Uh, I think about Charlie Azar, who is one of our uh, youth counselors. His uh, uncle has just been elected the Lutheran Bishop of Jerusalem, uh, and Charlie talks about himself as a bridge between the two sides of the conflict. Uh, he lives in Betzafafa, a neighborhood of Jerusalem very near to Bethlehem, uh, and crosses through the Bethlehem checkpoint almost every day to visit his family on the other side of the wall. Uh, and he speaks about the, his role and his sense of being a peacemaker uh, is to help his understand his Palestinian uh, friends and family understand the life of Israelis that he has met through Kids for Peace and vice versa, to interpret to the Israelis uh, who he has come to know through Kids for Peace what life for Palestinians really is like, including the occupation, including the violence, including the struggles that they have day by day. Uh, and for most of the Israelis and Kids for Peace, it's only through people like Charlie that they come to really know and understand what life is like for Palestinians. Uh, I know many Christians, myself included, care uh, deeply about the life of Palestinians and wish uh, that Israelis uh, on a whole would have more positive uh, perspectives and points of view, would understand the struggles and the injustices more deeply. Uh, and we find that in Kids for Peace that's happening through these people-to-people -people encounters uh, where young people who are trusted interpreters of each other's society can tell real stories of what life is like. Uh, Kids for Peace is not just a one-off dialogue program. This is a long-term uh, youth movement. Children join when they're 12 years old and continue with us until they graduate from high school. A six-year, year-long program, more than 100 hours of active programming every year uh, that touches everything from religion and culture to narratives of history to political issues to skills for social change, political advocacy, nonviolent action, the whole spectrum uh, of techniques to be able to move their societies uh, from conflict towards peace. Uh, already, we know that for every Kids for Peace uh, participant, uh, they're reaching about 100 other people in a given year with their message of peace. That's a multiplier effect of 100 times. Uh, our 500 kids 
um, multiply that by 100. That's how many people we're reaching in a given year. Uh, and what the fund would allow us to do is to scale up these proven effective programs to be able to reach a larger number of young people and increase that multiplier out. Uh, the International Fund in its current imagination um, would put $200 million a year into uh, programs who are working uh, between people to people uh, in this conflict. So that's about five times more than the funding now. Uh, if Kids for Peace could work with five times more participants uh, and have that multiplier effect of 100, we'd be reaching about 250,000 people in a given year, which is a critical mass uh, of the population of Jerusalem. Uh, so we see a lot of negative trends, but we also have organizations like Kids for Peace that are really well positioned to change the cultures of community, to set aside these false stereotypes that have been passed down uh, one generation after another, to connect the people on both sides of the conflict who really do want to work for peace uh, and to give them a platform for activism to be able to change their own communities and motivate their political leaders uh, to act in new and different ways. It's complex, difficult work, uh, but we find this rooted in the spiritual values that connect us, the respect for all people, the dignity of human life, um, this call to peace and reconciliation, which is present in our religious traditions, motivates young people to come together, to cross the barriers, uh, to look for a partner uh, in the other side, to honestly struggle with the hard questions, but also to ask what's next, what's the future that we have in store, and if we want that future to be different than the one that it is today, how can we act in new ways that will actually move our societies towards peace. We have an exciting uh, program that is, again, rooted in, in the church and has come to life over these last uh, 15 years. Uh, and we see in the fund huge potential to grow this community. There is massive demand. Uh, every year we bring about 100 new families into Kids for Peace. Uh, with funding, we could bring 300 more. Uh, there's a waiting list. People are dying for this opportunity uh, to meet the other, to give their children a chance to break this cycle of hate. Uh, and the investment that the fund would bring would provide the opportunity to do just that. Wonderful. Thank you, Josh. Um, I heard Joel say, and, and this speaks to some of the things you were just sharing about the Kids for Peace work, um, Josh, I heard Joel, you said that the People to People Fund is an and, not an or. Um, can, can you talk to um, us a bit about what's the and part? So people to people plus what um, in terms of a vision for what holistic peace building or constructive engagement in um, seeking to mitigate this conflict might look like? Um. Is, so I, I'm happy to go first and Josh, uh, if you want to go second, I, I think there are multiple strategies. I think you of course need a political negotiated solution between the leadership. I think that you also need to do humanitarian work. I think you also need to economically develop the society. I think you also need to change um, the political calculus of the parties in terms of when, they're ne when they behave negatively, there should be consequences, and when they behave positively, there should be consequences or benefits. I think that um, the complexity of the conflict is only underlined by the simplicity of some people's solutions. I think that you need to have a multiplicity of approaches. But when we look at it, we see that the one place where there is no systemic thinking is when you look at the grassroots. When you look at the international communities thought processes um, when it comes to other segments of this conflict and you have to do everything right. You can't just do civics. You can't just do politics. You can't just do economics. You can't just do humanitarian intervention. You need to do everything. And that's really complicated. Uh, but there is no entity that has a responsibility about looking at civil society. And, and that's broader. And I know Josh spoke about Kids for Peace, but it's broader than just giving money to NGOs. It's about uh, finding communities who are under the threat uh, of growing settlements or under rocket fire and making them feel secure. The real concept of the fund is about moving from individual to communal transformation. I know Gary can talk about this in Northern Ireland, about what it meant for communities to be to, to feel that level of support and investment within them, whether that was, you know, when I was in Belfast a few weeks ago, whether that was in markets, or whether that was in North Belfast, um, the fact that you work on a community level and you try and reinforce community dynamics to try and change society rather than an individual concept. Um, maybe before you, I don't know if you wanted to expand on that, Josh, but it's interesting to hear you say that, Joel, 
Um, we talked a lot about civil society really being left out during the CARI initiative and those, you know, nine months or so where there was a political process and there was, you know, all this talk about the possibility that there could be uh, not necessarily a negotiated settlement, what were they calling it, uh, um, a framework agreement, you know, by April of, uh, I don't remember exactly the year, if that was 2014 or um, but civil society in, in Palestine and in Israel was largely left out of the equation. And so you had these political actors in these conversations with seemingly very, very, very little buy-in from the actual people who would be living out whatever those political agreements might have been. Of course, there was not uh, any type of framework agreement and, and that initiative was not successful. But that brings me to... Um, something that you mentioned about the people to people fund in terms of um, Israel and Palestine would be managed by the government. You said, I think that you said this again, Joel, but you said that um, with Ireland, and maybe Gary could speak to us about this, that that was how the fund was managed. And so it brought legitimacy because both governments were involved or, or something like that. And so I'm curious, we had some questions come in about what countries do you see as the managers of this fund as it relates to Israel-Palestine? Um, and then another similar question, do you see the proposed international fund for Israel-Palestine being managed similarly to the way that the fund was managed in Ireland? So I don't know who wants those questions. There's a few of them embedded hey, there. But. Yeah. Can I maybe just pick up a little just on what Jewel was saying there and what everyone's been saying around this kind of political peace process versus what we call back home uh, the social peace process. I mean, a number of people back home around this really saying that the politicians by and large almost assume that even when a deal is done, that societal healing automatically follows. And we all know that nothing could be further from the truth. So the sorts of actions that need to take place is that civic society need to take ownership of moving towards a peace process. Looking at things like truth and reconciliation procedures, forgiveness and atonement strategies, public tolerance, compromise, how we do memory work, how we even remember the past, cultural symbols, etc., etc., etc. So that key of what we call back home now, the social peace process is absolutely crucial. And that really breaks up that hardened soil which many times holds communities back from peace. So I would want to underline that, that that is so, so important. And I think both Joel and Josh have been underlining that. Politicians of a role, absolutely no question about that. But back home, without European funding, without IFI funding and other philanthropists, primarily through the 90s, leading up to the Good Friday Agreement, there was no sense politicians doing a deal if society wasn't prepared for it. So it had to be a two-full strand. Uh, I often, it's like two railway tracks. They're running in parallel lines. Political peace processes will move. They will shape their own direction. But society needs to have some preparatory work done to bed down the peace and what we call the social peace process. So I just want to underline that is so, so key. Um, it, I, I can talk about the mechanics um, just because we've been sort of doing the intellectual work. Um, so... To understand the Irish Fund, the Irish Fund worked where the Joint Secretariat, the bureaucracy of the fund, was a joint directors general of um, the Irish government and the British government. And the funding mechanism came from both Capitol Hill and Congress and the Commonwealth. Um, so that's how um, that that's so the money came from legitimate sources in both communities and then was managed by um bureaucrats from both governments. The board of directors were actually three Catholics and three Protestants from across Ireland. Um, and look, in our ideal world, that's what would happen. The funding would come from places Israelis trust, which is Congress and, and basically North America. Uh, it would come from places that Palestinians trust, sort of um, Europe and some parts of the Arab world. Ideally, the fund would be jointly managed by Israelis, the Israeli MFA and the Palestinian uh, Foreign Ministry. And you'd have a board of directors of, um, uh, of Israelis and Palestinians selected by both communities with an international chair to avoid deadlock. That's the ideal. In reality, I don't know. I don't get to control it. We are, we're working with donor nations. 
Um, I think that um, there are multiple different abilities to try and make sure uh, how the funding could spend. Um, if you look at the congressional piece of legislation, USAID money is triple locked, but given just sort of how congressional appropriations work. So we don't envisage the money all sitting in the same account. And the American money might only be used to be spent in Israel. And some Arab money could be used in Gaza, European money in the West Bank. I, I'm not so prescriptive. We have to go back to the th- the, the concept behind it. And I, we've written hundreds of white papers and dozens of academic articles about the bureaucracy of this. And if people are very interested, I'm, I'm very happy to, to uh, in, you know, point them in those directions. But the key is this. Can we create coordination and scale of funding to give someone the job of what are we doing to make sure the next generation doesn't hate each other? That's the task. The question is how we get there. We believe that the best way to do that, given the financing realities around the world today, is to try and create a base diplomatic agreement where both parties agree to work on a culture of peace or something like that, and then build a fund around that. That's our thesis. Um, And I think that there is enough political capital and will in both parties to do something like that. If you look at the statements of both President Abbas and Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, that's that's what we're really looking to do. And I think from my perspective, this is a way to take some concrete, positive steps when it can seem very um, depressing and disappointing and uncertain about the future, that people will often wish for different leadership uh, or say the populations are not ready um, for peace. And the kind of work that this fund would enable, large-scale, coordinated, strategic, thoughtful, contributes to that readiness, like Gary was talking about before, contributes to the development of the kind of deep bench of leadership on both sides who are committed uh, to a solution. So rather than sort of waiting and hoping that somehow miraculously things will change or that someone will be pressured into changing their behavior, uh, this fund is a way of creating conditions that incentivize the kind of changes that we uh, hope to see. One of the things that I love that I hear all of you saying in one, uh, one shape or form, um, I, I don't know who exactly said uh, it was Joel, but that part of the work of the fund is to make sure that people don't hate each other. And for those of us, you know, all of us on the call are, are people of faith. And so at Churches for Middle East Peace, as Christian denominations come together, we care very deeply about Jesus's commandments of not only love your neighbor, but also love your enemy. And so this direct response um, to hatred that exists between these communities, um, I think is very inspiring and hopeful. Um, But one of the things I love that I've heard you articulate is, again, going back to that and not or, that, that to pursue addressing that hatred within societies or creating space for direct connections like Kids for Peace does, that that's not mitigating or um, that that's not in lieu of um, the work in those other spaces that you've talked about some, the humanitarian assistance of addressing real realities of lack of access to water or resources or um, human rights concerns, which, you know, Churches for Middle East Peace is an advocacy organization. We're doing a lot of work on human rights issues as it relates to prisoners or um, issues in Gaza or lack of mobility or movement. Um, and so I- I'm encouraged to hear you talk about this fund in light of one piece of this bigger picture. Um, and I'm curious if, um, you know, for, for a group like Churches for Middle East Peace, the integration of that advocacy work and some of those other aspects of the and uh, alongside of people to people work, um, like that's kind of the space that we live in. Do you feel like you have a lot of support or do you feel like, like, like groups um, migrate towards one or the other? You know, you're either an activist or, or you're someone who cares about people to people work. I, I'm curious about um, how you intersect with other groups either who support or would challenge this idea in light of some of those things. Josh, you wanna go first? Sure, I think that the, within our, even within our own Kids for Peace community are um, people who are doing both, right? That our, our youth, our parents, our staff are both activists in the realm of human rights and economic development and, uh, humanitarian assistance and they're involved in people to people work and I think with internally within Kids for Peace that combination is actually really really helpful because 
the, the connectivity is not simply like I'm from identity A, you're from identity B, and we need each other. It's that I see you working for peace and justice within your community, you see me working for peace and justice within my community, and together we can actually make a, a greater difference than we might have uh, thought about before. And so, um, I mean, Kitsuris is embedded in the neighborhoods of Jerusalem. We have people who are going back and forth uh, to and from the checkpoints. They're dealing with issues like the behavior of soldiers, like unequal distribution of municipal funding, like uh, the presence or lack thereof of after-school programming in East Jerusalem, the quality of school systems, I mean, all of these um, human rights Equal, social equality issues are very much a part of the life of our whole uh, Kids for Peace community. And so when they come together, they bring that activism with them. I think within the broader um, world of our, our supporters, uh, donors, and, and friends, there sometimes is this challenge, right? There sometimes is a sense that other issues are more urgent, that they're um, there are these realities of the conflict, realities of the occupation that are so offensive and disturbing that they require sort of 100% of focus of our attention on them and the, the work of, of dialogue and reconciliation and peace building can seem like, um, um, as one of our colleagues would say, sort of nice but not necessary, right? Something we can get around to later. But history has told us, uh, our experience has told us that you can't just wait around for later, that we have to pursue both of these strategies simultaneously um, because the people-to-people -people work has a cumulatively positive effect, right? That the, this momentum builds over time. Uh, and so we need to give ourselves space, I believe, certainly as a Christian, both to care for issues of justice and rights and equality passionately and care for issues of peace and reconciliation simultaneously and, and see that as a dual vocation that we can do um, can do at once. And I think that is a spiritual challenge, especially when we see things that make us angry or frustrated or great against our sense uh, of what's right and wrong in the world. But this is very complex. Uh, and even as we uh, connect with one piece of our passion, it doesn't mean we have to give up the other part of our vocation uh, in order to do it. Um, and for me, the modeling is our own youth and families living in the conflict who they themselves do this. They themselves bring activism and reconciliation together. So if they can do it, then we can too. Uh, I just uh, add quickly, and uh, I'd love to hear from Gary about uh, the 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 role of Irish Americans in terms of during the peace process and a few other things. The first thing I'd say is, despite the asymmetry of power, if you're a, if you're an average Israeli who lives in the South, you don't feel powerful when rockets come and hit you. You just don't, and it, it's it's always important that despite the recognition uh, of the asymmetry, the, the symmetry of fear and mistrust, I can't stress strongly enough. Um, it, there is a reality that disconnects from the human level to the political level. It doesn't mean you ignore the political level. I think if you ignore it, you do it at your peril because you, you're no longer relevant. But we shouldn't become detached from the human experiences of the people who make up the populations. And the, the fear and mistrust is, a, is an equalized concept, at least on that level. It's very important to stress that. Um, because we can often get lost because of just the political realities. Um, and I, I always find it important, especially in progressive spaces, to stress this. Just, for example, as I do when I sit in conservative spaces, I, I stress the realities of the politics, less of the human sort of interaction. And, and in that way, that's just an opening to say we work with everyone. We, are, we work with Palestinian groups, Israeli groups, we work with Christian groups, with Jewish groups, with Muslim groups. Uh, I speak both at um, the Holy Land Christian at ecumenical conferences as well as APAC. I do all of them because the reality is that all of these elements are needed if we're going to be politically successful. Um, there's a natural competition um, in all peace building, not just in Israel and Palestine, between the demands of human rights and accountability and peace and reconciliation. It's a, it's a natural tension between peace and justice. There isn't a natural um, there isn't an, an exact science about how you do it, and each side needs to be respectful to one another. Um, the, the reality is some sort of mushiness in between. Um, and uh, I would say that moral purity is something that peace builders can't, is a, is a luxury peace builders can't, can't have if they want to be effective. There are people that I've met on both sides of this conflict that have done horrendous stuff to each other, and you need to work with them if you're going to be effective. And I think that if we're looking to be morally pure, you can do that and you can share from the sidelines, but you can't be in the middle. You can't work to really create peace if you, um, 
in that way. Uh, and it, it's something that's difficult. So yes, I think that whether it's the human rights community or the security community or things in between, we sometimes butt heads with, but we do so gently, respectfully, and find ways to try and work with one another wherever possible. And the, the rule that we have at OMEP is we never attack another group and we never attack another group's source of funding ever. Um, we ask respectfully for us to be allowed to do our work in the face of great difficult challenges on the ground. There has never been a more difficult time to do people-to-people -people work, given the restriction of space both within Israeli and Palestinian society today. And so we ask respectfully for us to do our work credibly, and we are self-reflexive, and we are self-critical. We are not doing hummus dialogue and going home and pretending that everything's fine. But um, we asked for that. But I'd love to hear from Gary about some analogies about the Irish community at the time and sort of the role of diaspora communities there. Okay. Yes, I mean, I'm happy enough to chip into that whole conversation. I think underlining as well, or what Joel is saying, um, in our peace process, we had to bring in what were classed as extremes from both sides. And that was undoubtedly painful for many people. The idea again was we had to get as many people around the table as possible to allow ownership of a very, very difficult situation. I mean, we're going back here in Irish society 800 years years or 500 years of protracted conflict. Terrorism, division, fear, hatred, mistrust run incredibly deep. I remember after the Good Friday Agreement, uh, Tony Blair's Chief of Staff, Jonathan Paul, writing a book entitled Great Hatred Little Room, which was simply subtext for uh, the hatred was so intense between these two communities, there was really little room for any negotiation. The Good Friday Agreement got us over the line. And I think as Joel has alluded to in that, Irish America did play a significant role. Uh, there's no question about it. In, in the early days of the conflict, um, Irish America was seen by those in the British Protestant Unionist loyalist tradition as supportive of political violence of the IRA. But there began a maturity, I would say, among Irish America, realising that these two communities, i.e. the British Protestant, Unionist, Loyalist community and the Irish, Catholic, Republican, Nationalist community simply had to share this space of land together. The British who had been there for 400 years plus were not going anywhere. So even Republicanism now would say, using phrases like Brits out, which was the mantra of Republicanism in the early part of the conflict, is no longer viable. People need to learn to share space. And undoubtedly, European Union and the United States, Irish America, all came to that conclusion. The only way to resolve this conflict is through sharing space, sharing power, one another, stopping the dehumanization of one another. And that was absolutely crucial. I mean, Martin Luther King, uh, King Jr. once said, it is possible to be too late in history with the right answers. It is possible to be too late in history with the right answers. That's why I think this fund is so crucial. I think there's a window. I think there's an opportunity. I think there is a moment in time to allow this to happen. I don't want to be, if I'm still alive in 10 years' time, to be having this conversation and saying, why did we not do this in 017 and 018? I think there's a moment. And having worked in this area for three decades of my life, I was a child of conflict, a young adult of conflict. I'm now still a middle-aged man of conflict as I work on my peace process when I'm back home. I think it's a window. And uh, I would really encourage as many folk as possible with all your diverse opinions, pro this, pro that, supportive of this, an opinion of this, an opinion of that. I think Joel hit the nail on the head. We need every person at the table. The elements of the Irish peace process even though it's still bumpy. And I've hosted 300 Israelis and Palestinians in Belfast in the last five years. And one of the things they like about this, this is not utopia. This is not clean and pristine and nice. Maintaining peace, even post-conflict. One of the things that struck me that you said when you just started, Gary, is you said something about, we know how to stop war, but we don't know how to make peace. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I just I thought that was a striking kind of um, you know expression of some of the experiences in Ireland. 
So we have about uh, 10 minutes left, uh, just a little bit more than 10 minutes, and I have three or four questions. Um, several folks have been uh, viewing us from a distance and chatting. Um, this is being recorded so people will be able to see it if they missed uh, our time together live. Um, so this question says, the concept of the social peace process makes a lot of sense to me, but some believe that getting members of the two sides together before a just resolution has been established amounts to, quote, normalization, end quote, of an oppressive situation. How can we integrate the concept of social peace process while avoiding normalization? Um, I, I think that, uh, and Josh, I, I think that your programmatic work is key, but I'll talk in the macro if you want to talk in the micro. Um, look, normalization, uh, which is an accusation made that you are normalizing an unnormal situation, um, is an important concept to tackle, but also one that we should, we should put within its proper context. Um, if this work is done as beautification of the occupation, for sure it should be opposed. I, I don't think you'd even have criticism from many of our members. But the, the field has evolved and the work that's going on, and when we look at the best practice, this is work that is attracting people. It works on mutual shared interest. And the fact is you make people you don't like. You make peace with people you don't like and you don't get on with. And if you go today to Palestine, um, people are willing to speak to settlers, people are willing to work with groups like Women Wage Peace that don't use the term occupation because they know they reach more people than the traditional communities they were working with. People are willing to participate in programming that they feel is effectual, that is effective, rather than ones that make them feel good. Now, it's not for everyone, and nor should we ever say that everyone must participate. But neither should we say just because some people wish to view their resistance as dialogue as dialogue as a form of resistance, should we shut those voices down? That is not the voice of Democrats. That is not the voice of a healthy society. And I would, I would urge those to say that whether it's young girls from Creativity for Peace who have recently been attacked with you know, horrendous sexual violent threats, uh, whether it's um, sort of different challenges and tribulations that some in the community have gone after, I think that we should be strong enough as a community who are trying to change a situation to recognize there is a multiplicity of voices. And just as our community recognizes there are people who disagree with us and that's okay, so too other communities should recognize that you don't need to own the complete conversation to be effective. Thank you. Um, okay, here's the next question. You talked about consequences for parties that don't behave well. What would those consequences look like? Considering the international community has been trying to punish Hamas for a decade to no avail, how would you suggest working with hostile, hostile parties like Hamas? Josh? I don't know that that's my uh, area of expertise, but I'll bring it for a minute here and hear how um, in your situation, you actually did work with, um, with parties that needed to be um, moved to do things maybe that they didn't want to do. I mean, I think there are, um, that there are the, the, the consequences at the, at the political level that have to be managed by um, managed by governments. I think some of the the consequences at the social level have to do with shifting social norms within communities. Uh, so, for instance, within our world, the um, the youth culture within a lot of um, Israeli high school communities. Uh, allows for things like uh, the chanting of death to Arabs as a source of pride, sort of a soccer cheer. And one of the things that our teens are trying very hard to do is to, to shift those cultural norms. And so that certain behaviors become uh, seen as not acceptable within the life uh, of a certain communities, um, within a certain community's scope. Uh, and I think that we have to be about how we shift those social norms one of the things we're spending a lot of time thinking about now is around Jerusalem Day and the different kinds of demonstrations that happen in the life of the city, uh, the way that different uh, political and national symbols are allowed to be present or not present. Often there are these sort of informal social norms that get enforced beyond sort of legal and political issues that can provide, uh, that can cause a chilling effect um, and allow for extremist voices to, um, 
to run free without any uh, without anyone stopping them or calling them out. And so that's the realm in which we have been working. And we find that the best way to do that actually is to bring in allies from those communities themselves who can be credible and authoritative and thoughtful voices. Uh, so uh, Le Haba is one of a, a Jewish extremist group that spends a lot of time harassing and often committing acts of violence against uh, Palestinians. Uh, our role is to find bridges. Who do we know who is connected to that community? What kind of, um, of conversation can we begin with them to try and bring them into the peace process, bring them towards the table, as I was saying, rather than uh, exclude them, to, to find a way of, uh, of changing their behavior and bringing them to the table simultaneously. That kind of thing can only happen between people who have some bit of connectivity and trust um, who, who can make that happen. There are obviously larger um, political uh, pieces of this puzzle uh, as well. So we're going to squeeze in two more questions and then each of you will have an opportunity for some last words before we close. Um, so we'll go through these quickly. Um, how do you make the case in the current political US climate where there's a desire to cut budgets that it's critically important for the U.S. to help provide monetary support to the fund? I think that's a good question. We've been pretty successful. Uh, 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 despite the $5.8 billion cut to the State Department, we've made sure that the USAID Conflict Management and Mitigation Grant Program is fully funded for FY18. So it will be a full $26 million for global people-to-people -people work, of which 10 million will be spent on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I think that there's a desire and a recognition um, that we've tried everything else. In addition, uh, without getting too political, um, you know, the Trump administration is focused on this conflict. Uh, actually today, Jared Kushner, Jason Greenblatt, Diana Powell are out there right now. Um, his senior advisors are there, he's staffed this, he's funding it appropriately. So I think that if you can make the argument that it buttresses the approach of what the US is trying to do, I think you can successfully advocate for the financial capital, especially if it's leveraged against other uh, potentially existing uh, other countries in terms of being able to come in. Thank you. Um, this last question is for Josh, uh, and then we'll go to Gary for some closing comments. Um, Josh, can you speak to where some of the earliest alumni of Kids for Peace are now? Do you have folks who've gone on to work within the government or are engaged in policymaking? Great question. Um, uh, because Kids for Peace works with kids who are young, um, our oldest alumni are just now about 26, 27 years old. Uh, so I would love to get this question in about three or four more years uh, and have some, some more stories to tell. Uh, I'll be honest, in the early years of Kids for Peace, the program was just a, a two-week summer camp, a one-time experience where people met each other, had a shift in their attitudes, um, and, and encountered a world that they didn't know existed. Um, but we learned over time that that kind of one off dialogue experience is not sufficient to really change the course of someone's life, not sufficient to really change uh, their behavior. So we made huge shifts in the program of Kids for Peace uh, into this long-term sustained model that we have now uh, so that young people are um, are learning habits of, of activism and policy making already within the program and not just hoping that they'll do that somehow on their own outside the program. So for instance, we had a 50 of our young leaders in Washington DC this past summer uh, spending 10 days learning all about policymakers. They were meeting with think tanks and presenting at the State Department and with key decision makers. They were on Capitol Hill at 29 different meetings with the House and Senate advocating for HR 1221, the legislation to create uh, this international fund for Israeli-Palestinian peace. So while we don't have uh, amazing stories from the early days of Kids for Peace, we think part of that is because of the uh, the program model that we had then, which was not a, uh, the best one. Uh, and this is how we as a organization committed to learning are, are shifting our model over time so that we know now uh, our participants are already uh, taking steps in, in policy making uh, through the USAID grant, which we have uh, right now through the conflict management and mitigation program. Uh, our oldest youth are organizing youth led town hall meetings with uh, political and civic leaders from Jerusalem already again already as teenagers uh, are getting involved in the policy making process, learning how to make their voices heard. Uh, we're engaging key leaders from the municipality and uh, governments as well. Uh, so the, the goal of Kids for Peace really is to develop these habits of, of activism and involvement in the political process 
habits already from the time that they're teenagers so that this becomes a course uh, that they're committed to for the rest of their lives. One of the favorite parts of my summer is greeting them and welcoming them when you allow me the privilege and being able to share a few words and then praying over them and blessing them and hearing their confidence and all that they know. And um, it's just wonderful and inspiring to see uh, them in that context and the work that you do. So thank you. Gary, closing words, and then each of you will have an opportunity to say a few things as we wrap this up. Gary? Yes, yeah, just a couple of thoughts. I just lost you slightly there, May. A couple of things just that, you know, listening to the, the swathe of questions are in the context of meaningful relationships. That's the first thing I want to say. And I was speaking to people from the other side, Republicans, those involved in the IRA during the height of the conflict. And Catholic priests were speaking to those from my community, Unionist loyalists who were killing as well. Governments can't necessarily do that. I acknowledge that, that it's always not politically correct for governments to speak to those who are pursuing terrorism or political violence, whatever phraseology you want to put on. But I do still want to underline that change takes place in the context of relationships. That's why I believe as a religious leader, religion has a role to play here. To say that engagement is not endorsement. Because I speak to a person does not mean I am endorsing their worldview. Many times people I speak to who are pursuing political violence, I'm trying to act as an influencer, a redirector, as an agent of change. I think it's important to say that as well. I think the third and final thing I want to say is, and I'm quoting this in the South African context, where one writer said, reconciliation is no cheap matter. It does not come about by simply papering over deep, seated differences, reconciliation presupposes confrontation. And one of the things the International Fund for Ireland did was allow us to have the phraseology we've used as uncomfortable conversations. And I've heard that from, from Joel. People will change in the context of relationships, but that relationship needs to happen at grassroots civic society. The last thing the Middle East needs in 10 years time is a peace process that is not embraced by every person. So that hardened soil needs broken up so that it becomes more fertile, that when the water of peace, hopefully in the future, does begin to fall, some plants will begin to grow. That's why I think this, this fund could be absolutely crucial and critical in some of those narratives that currently exist in the ground. Mm. That's a good, good word. Thank you. Joel? I mean, you've been courageous in being in this space with both feet and all of your being and, and your work. Uh, what are your closing words for our time together? Um, uh, I would say that there are three things that I'd want to finish on. It's always difficult to follow Gary. Um, his, uh, his, power, his poetry comes from a, a harsh realism. I got to spend some time with Gary and some former Protestant paramilitaries a few weeks ago, and it, it was a very moving experience. Um, the first is, to be effective, you need to be optimistic but politically savvy. And that's what we are. If you have to ask what OMEP is in a, in a sentence, we are optimism with political savvy. We are not doughy-eyed. We don't run into walls that we don't know where the cracks are to try and get through. And, uh, and I think that um, there are political realities in all the countries we work in that we're very attuned to. And rather than screaming into the whirlwind, we try and find the ability to make practical change for the people on the ground. And so that's number one. Number two, we win quite a bit. Despite the fact that the, uh, the conflict is ongoing and it's horrible, if you look at our success in terms of appropriations work, if you look at our success in terms of bipartisanism, in terms of our ability to get the endorsements and where we've come given sort of the work. May, you mentioned the Kerry approach, even though John Kerry never met with a single civil society actor, um, the thing that survived him was the quartet report. And if you look at the 10th recommendation, it's around civil society. It's the first time civil society has ever been mentioned at that level. And that was given a significant amount of work that OMEP and others did to do that. So two were winners. And that's very important in the political context. No one wants to back a losing horse. And third, we're uncomfortable. We make everyone uncomfortable. 
And if you're comfortable being with us, you're doing something wrong. It's very uncomfortable to, to have to deal with the morality of dealing in an asymmetric conflict, whether it's me as a religious Jew having to deal with people saying, I can't pray on ha it because it's politically untenable and I need to reduce my religiosity on the holiest site for me as a Jew. And that by even talking about Temple Mount, I'm somehow a religious fundamentalist. And on the flip side, for, for many Palestinians, just having to deal with the fact that they have to talk to the people oppressing them and that they can't just, you know, force their way out of the situation where it sort of behooves you to imagine that that should be the moral thing to do is deeply problematic. It's deeply hurtful to try and recognize that that's not going to be, it's not a winning strategy when you're dealing with, you know, the current realities of how strong the Israeli Israel is as a country and the realities of conscription and the other things. So I think that being savvy and optimistic, understanding that we do win and that it is an uncomfortable thing to try and work for peace are the three messages that I think are really important if we're going to do this work effectively. And really, May, just thank you for hosting this important conversation. Really grateful to each of you for coming and the way that each of your points and your um, entry, you know, you're each working in different spaces. And so the contribution of the three of you together uh, is really helpful. So Josh, how about for you, closing words? Uh, a closing word is um, what my, my organization's other founder always says is to keep the faith, right? That we do this um, because we want to see results and we want to win, but also because we know that this is the right thing to do. Uh, and that is what our faith calls us to do. It's uh, we have an ability to uh, take courageous action, even in the face uh, of opposition. Uh, many of our young people are called traitors and spies and betrayers of their community, and they all reroute back in their own religious tradition, their own religious commitment that this is the right thing to do. Um, and that when you look at this from the long haul, uh, that there is an arc and that there is uh, an importance of faithfulness, an importance of uh, of steady, sustained effort uh, doing the right thing in the face of challenges. Uh, that that's what makes a real difference in the world. Uh, second is to Mary's point about change happening in the context of relationships, uh, that it's one thing to speak your truth, it's another thing to be heard by the person that you want to listen to you. Uh, and I think within Kids for Peace, one of the things we do best is to create context in which people can both speak and be heard. Um, and it's that being heard and being understood and being respected and being honored for who you are uh, that changes the life uh, of both parties. And that is sensitive, complex work, but it is happening. Uh, the third thing I'd say is to remember the positive story. We often hear news out of the region that is 100% negative. Uh, and that uh, is, uh, for me, I, one of the things I tell groups when I speak to them is remember whenever you hear um, something negative in the news, know that Kids for Peace is also there in that same neighborhood. In every part of Jerusalem, uh, there are families who are, uh, are struggling and working for a more positive future and to not allow the negative narrative to uh, be the only overwhelming one. Uh, the last thing I would say is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can often become uh, the elephant in the room of American interfaith relationships, uh, the thing that we can't talk about, the issue that we don't know how to deal with, the thing that can uh, cause deterioration or um, set some kind of litmus test about whether people can speak with one another. Uh, and if we had another webinar, I could talk about this some other day, but Kids for Peace also works uh, on domestic interfaith cooperation, building local chapters of youth in the United States who are able to have domestic interfaith relationships focused on the needs and realities of our own communities while not ignoring the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and acting as agents of change in how U.S. religious communities orient around uh, this issue. Uh, and so I would just leave that as a to say there is a way that is possible, difficult, challenging on its own terms um, to orient U.S. interfaith relationships in light of conflict without ignoring it. Um, so thank you again for the, the chance to, to be here today. Well, thank each of you. And I would encourage all the people who are watching to go to each of your respective websites, Kids for Peace, um, the Alliance for Middle East Peace, um, Gary, your organization, Rethinking Conflict, so we hope that people will continue to use you as a resource. We'll post this video online and point people to it. Um, and just for you to know, Churches for Middle East Peace is continually trying to create space for these kinds of conversations. So we try to do um, about once a month a conversation with groups like yours, or not that there are groups like yours, you guys are one of a kind, but um, with people and organizations in this space. And then one of our goals as well is to bring people to Washington, DC to actually do advocacy work. 
So we have an advocacy summit that's specifically targeting millennials coming up this November, November 14th through 16th, where young people, um, millennials from around the United States will be coming to Washington, D.C. to hear from experts like each of you and then to have the opportunity to talk to their elected officials. So we're grateful for the introduction um, that you've given us for this fund. We hope you'll keep us informed as there's progress and we'll look forward to the opportunities that we have to next connect. So I loved your word, Josh, keep faith. I think that's a good word for us to close on, but grateful for each of you. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a good day. Josh, thanks, Jill. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Best wishes, be in touch. Bye-bye.